Howdy once again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. Thanks for joining me, and this is part six of the continuing series that I'm making on the Clausing Horizontal Milling Machine. And in this one, I want to deal with the various parts and components of the machine so we have the correct terminology or nomenclature. So let's get on with it. First of all, why do we call this a horizontal milling machine rather than a vertical? Well, horizontal milling machines were probably the standard of the industry for over a hundred years until they came up with the vertical machines or vertical attachments, but of course the spindle runs horizontally here with most of the tooling held in this manner or on an arbor as opposed to vertical machines such as bridge ports where the tool is held uh, in a vertical spindle by various means. So we'll uh, confine our discussion to the horizontal today. Some horizontals are available with vertical attachments. To my knowledge there is no vertical attachment for this machine. However, Clausing did make a companion machine to this, very similar, that was vertical uh, and I believe it had an R8 spindle, I might be wrong on that, but this uh, is a, a series of machines that were very popular in schools because they were rather small and semi-affordable. Some of this is a repeat, it's been mentioned in previous videos, but this is a number 30 American Standard Milling Machine Taper. It's a steep taper. It is not a self-holding taper as are Morse tapers and many other tapers. So in other words if you don't have a drawbar to hold this in it isn't going to stay in by itself. It has to be held in place, pulled into the taper by a drawbar and this is the drawbar. And there's a spindle hole that goes all the way through and a 21-30 seconds diameter so relatively small. So they also make machines larger machines that are number 40 and number 50. A number 50 milling machine taper is a very popular one on larger machines. This number 30 was also used on the vertical south bend milling machine of which they did not make very many as far as I uh, know and I, but I did have one at the high school. Since this is not a self-holding uh, taper there are lugs provided on the spindle here and the lugs fit into these slots in the holders and uh, that's what does the actual driving. Otherwise there's a probably a tendency for the taper to slip in the spindle. So that's the way they're designed and built. This is the specification sheet for the closing mill and this came out of the service manual pause your video if you want to study this. Now here are the main parts of the milling machine and some of this was covered in the other videos but down here we have the base and that's a chip pan there as well. This is the column. The column supports all of the other parts basically and includes the spindle and the overarms here but more specifically here we have the table the saddle, which is rather hidden here, but it's talked about in the other uh, videos, and then this is the knee. Sometimes these milling machines were uh, called knee milling machines. Visualize yourself standing against a wall and raising your leg and your knee sticking out, and I think that's where the name was derived. The table is only seven inches wide by about 25 inches long, and the T-slots are 9 16 so I did not have any uh, clamping uh, T-bolts or, or anything for that size, so I did order these recently from uh, KBC Tools. It was about $60, and that gives me uh, T-bolts that will fit into the slots. This is another page from the closing manual showing and describing the parts of the machine. Pause your video if you want to study this. The table traverses in this direction which is said to be the x-axis and can be moved with a hand wheel on either end. This is the clamp that will clamp it in one position for rigidity during certain milling operations. 
The table can also be operated from this end and there's a little bit of a gearbox here and a crank and by the way we have graduated dials here. This machine is not equipped with the digital readout but by pushing the uh, crank in we have what amounts to a rapid traverse. By pulling it out that's just a one to one ratio. If I could get my camera on the crank on the other end, you'd see that it's moving at the same rate. And then there's a neutral position right here, so that if one is using the power feed, this isn't going to come around and hit you. Quite a nice attachment, really. On the front of the table is a T-slot, and in the T-slot, there should be a total of four stops. Uh, three are lost, so I only have one. I have to make... Uh, several of them but the idea here is that that can be locked down and if you're using power feed the table will uh, eventually sh uh, strike the stop and that'll turn the power feed off so you do not crash it and there would be permanent ones as well there's a threaded hole on each end that would be bolted in permanently in other words they're not movable so there's two that are not movable and two that are adjustable the table can be moved in and out, that is traversed in and out, and that is the Y axis. Sometimes uh, I call that the cross feed, although that might be a term more applicable to the lathe. And then right under here is a lock so that we can lock it so there is no movement in the Y axis. Again, this is the knee, and it's raised and lowered, and that's the Z axis, raised and lowered by this screw called the knee lift screw and we move it in the vertical direction with this hand crank. That can be taken off also to get it out of your way and there are two locks right here that will lock the knee in position and of course that's the dovetail there on which the uh, knee rides and is located very accurately. This is a milling machine arbor, one inch diameter. It has, of course, the correct taper right here and cleaning that up a little bit, putting it into position. It's held like that and I'm tightening the drawbar with my right hand, which is uh, out of your vision right now. And that's how the horizontal arbor is held in place. Now it has to be supported. The maximum size cutter for this machine is a 6 inch. Anything larger than that would interfere with the overarms. Now, the arbor has to be supported. This would flex or bend or even break if it wasn't supported. So we use the arbor support here which has a bronze bearing and we have two holes here that uh, fit on to these arms. So let me get this started on the arms and then slide it into this uh, the end of the arbor here for support. I think I'm really telling you a little bit too much in this video. It really was meant just to talk about the, the parts but uh, I guess this is the best way to explain them. So now the arbor support is on the overarms here and it would be tightened at this point, lubricated real well and then it can be pushed in Actually, the correct name, these are the overarms. I may have used a different term. So it's, that's pushed on to the arbor. And then this has already been tightened, but then we have two clamping screws here that must be tightened very securely. And then there's a place to oil that. That was mentioned in the oiling video. And from this view, you can see how very well supported it is. When taking heavy cuts and possibly on harder materials with larger cutters, you need extra support. And this casting that I just put on there is called the overarm brace and it bolts up here. It's got a slot in it and you got to make sure that your overarms are pushed back so that this doesn't hit it. And then incorrectly in a previous video, I said that uh, this brace was to be clamped some other place. I had it wrong. Uh, there are two holes right here. The bolts are not in place now, but you would bolt one here and one here. And you would have to loosen this clamping bolt when you raise and lower the knee. Otherwise, it's locked in that position. So that's how that works, and it gives a, 
a great deal of added support and you'll find that uh, much larger machines like Milwaukee's and Cincinnati's and Kearney and Trekkers also employ that type of brace. It is not used for, it is not necessary for every operation, only for heavier operations because it is rather cumbersome and in the way. Up here on the top is the reversing switch, uh, on, forward, and reverse. It's a drum switch. And also on this side is the speed control, very similar to what's on a closing lathe. And I'm going to talk in the next video about how to change speeds, how to adjust the feeds, and all of that information. This is the main gearbox here that is belt driven directly from the motor and that is called the table feed gearbox and right here we have a drive shaft that goes into another gearbox I'll move the camera around so you can see that but we have uh, two controls here two knobs uh, in which to adjust to different uh, feed rates there are 12 different feeds in all the closing has two different speed uh, ranges direct drive and back gear and this is the controller for that there's also what amounts to a bull gear on the back side I'll talk about that in the next video uh, in regards to the speeds now looking at it from this angle again here's the main gearbox back here but the drive shaft comes into another gearbox here that is called the reverse feed gearbox and I had that apart you saw that in one of the previous videos and there are two controls here. One, the lever here is the table feed lever. In other words, that turns the feed on and off. And then we have a knob here that is the feed direction hand wheel. So that would change it from feeding left to right to the other direction, which would be right to left. And you're going to find that regardless of the manufacturer, a knee type of horizontal milling machine is a uh, it's pretty much the same. Now some of the controls are going to be in different positions and the larger machines are going to have power feeds in both the uh, X, Y, and Z directions. Uh, this is a smaller one so we only have it in one direction. But this pretty much concludes the discussion on the various parts of the machines. Join me in the following video where I talk about uh, how to adjust the speeds and the feeds. Then I think finally the machine is ready to use, but it's really necessary that you familiarize yourself with all of the different controls and nomenclature on any machine before you operate it. Thanks for watching. This is Tubal Kane saying so long for now.